As we focus on the process for research, we have four critical objectives in this lecture. First, to discuss the research process. Second, to establish the purpose of the literature review. Third, provide recommendations for desk research. And fourth, provide a model for research-based documentation. Simply stated, the purpose of research is to produce new knowledge or new insights into topics or problems. Research represents the intersection between what has come before us or previous truths that we have already identified and what we think might be right but don't quite know yet. We use research as the tool to help us understand phenomena in new ways. One of the two primary approaches to knowledge acquisition is inductive reasoning, where we move from specific observations to general rules. Inductive reasoning always begins with a knowledge gap. This leads to new observations where we can detect and analyze new patterns. Then we draw tentative conclusions from those patterns in order to produce theory. We do this in our everyday lives. For example, if we're trying to catch a bus into city center, we'll begin by trying to figure out which bus we should get and when it comes. If we don't know, we're likely to go online or use an app to figure out. We also have to figure out where our nearest stop is. So once we do our background research, we have an idea about what to expect, but then we have to test that out when we go actually catch the bus. Does the right bus come and at the time that we're expecting it? So sometimes there can be a discrepancy between the published schedule and what really happens. For example, when I lived in Manchester, my bus into city center was almost always about 10 minutes late in the mornings. That meant that I noticed a pattern and I could draw a tentative conclusion that instead of standing in the cold and rain for an extra 10, I could wait just a little while before heading out the door. Over time, I used observation to see that if I did really wait the 10 minutes, I wasn't going to miss my bus. So that let my conclusion be valid enough to let me adjust my morning schedule. And so I arrived at the theory that I could wait just an extra few minutes before leaving the house. That didn't necessarily fully settle the question. Was it every day? Was it only on school days? And so there was a new knowledge gap. And so the, the cycle repeats. It's a really simple example of how we might use inductive reasoning in our own research into a routine situation. But when we do this with problems or topics that we're interested in in terms of formal research, we follow the same kind of a process. Here's an idea about how this translates into a formal piece of research. We begin with asking, what are the knowledge gaps in a particular field of study? In order to know what the knowledge gaps are, we have to do desk research to identify what other researchers and practitioners have found in their experience and their research. This lets us ask informed research questions. Then we gather data and work to identify the patterns in the data to help us uncover new knowledge. We're using our data then to answer the questions and over time we're able to spot the patterns and build a theory. Now I know there are a lot of people and especially some practitioners who will balk at the idea of theory because they somehow see theory as being disconnected from reality. However, they couldn't be more wrong. In our field, in applied fields, theory comes from real world observations and research. The best way to think about theory is like a playbook. Any good sports manager will begin the game with a plan and an idea based on knowledge of the opponents and his or her own team. Now, of course, in practice, we may have to diverge from the playbook, but it gives us a starting point and one that comes from good information. And that's exactly what theory does for us in the real world. That's why we always begin with what other people have found, best practices, and transferable knowledge before beginning to make insights and recommendations of our own. Every good piece of research that we do begins with a literature review or what we call desk research. But why do we start here? Why do we start with a literature review? There are six reasons to do this. First is that we need to generate ideas and research questions in order to be able to have a competent way of, of 
researching the gaps in our knowledge, we need to understand what those gaps actually are. So we dig into what has come before us, what other people have done, and try and figure out best practices as well as gaps in, in what we should be doing. Second, as this is especially true for students and people who are learning and improving their research skills. Very simply, we want to see good examples of well executed research. If it's gone through a peer review process, and we'll speak more about this a little bit later, but if it's gone through a good peer review process, this means that experts in the field have looked at a piece of research and judged that it is making a contribution to the field. Similarly, with good journalistic work, there's an editor who has asked similar kinds of questions in terms of it being valid and reliable at different kinds of levels. So when we look at what's been done before, it should give us a way to model what we do ourselves. Third, it also helps us to avoid reinventing the wheel. If there's a process that's been followed that has produced good results, if there are particular questions that have been asked before, we should take those best practices and implement them within our own research and within our own process so that we can improve what we do, maybe fine tune what's happened before, but there's no point to start completely from scratch every single time. Good desk research can give us an idea about how to move forward. Fourth, good desk research helps us synthesize what's known about the topic. So we may find 20, 30, 40 articles about our topic. What we have to do then is to put them together to try and identify what themes are consistent across this whole body of research. So it lets us condense down to what really matters and what seems to across a whole lot of different works be missing and be best practice. Fifth, it gives us credibility. So it helps to support our research choices. If we're making the argument that there is a credible gap, we need to show evidence for that. So desk research and literature review helps to lend credibility. It also demonstrates that we have the credibility to conduct the research, that we are actually an authority on it because we are synthesizing all of this information that has come before us. And finally, it lets us develop an argument for our study. Now, in a practical context, it's about trying to generate the return on the investment and demonstrating to our managers and to our clients that what we are doing is actually going to be worthwhile, that it's going to be financially or reputationally advantageous. In an academic sense, it's to show that the research that we're doing can potentially have an impact on the field. Everything that we do then about pitching, conducting and summarizing our research is about making a good argument about the nature of the the phenomenon the state of of our field and trying to show that what we are doing is worthwhile the bottom line is that the literature review or desk research establishes the need and the credibility for any study regardless of whether we're doing it for clients, for our organizations, or for publication. This is really what's at the heart of it. We show that we know what we're doing, and we show that there's an actual need for it. I have about 20 years of experience in reading other people's writing. This includes work editing magazines and online publications, reviewing practitioner research, being an academic journal editor, serving on a lot of editorial boards over the years, and certainly reading a lot of student research. So there are some common problems that write-ups of literature reviews often have. First, they can often lack a clear focus. The purpose of the literature review is twofold. First is to provide the reader with a strong background on what research has come before, but second, and importantly, to also lead the reader to our particular piece of research. So too often there's a kitchen sink approach to a literature review where people try and shove in every piece of research that they've ever read. 
but the fact is that that's useless unless it's directly leading to our specific study. It, that piece of literature just shouldn't be included. Second, lit reviews can sometimes feel like a book report. Now I blame this on the way that we're taught to write in primary and secondary levels of school. What we're asked to do all too often is just summarize information without offering any meaningful synthesis of multiple pieces or really to analyze it in any real way. Description is boring and it doesn't help to build the credibility or the need for the study. What good lit reviews do is to identify the commonalities or the differences across several pieces of research, offer a brief summary of these critical components so that the reader has context, but then to focus on an argument about the nature of knowledge and information in the field. Third, oftentimes authors get so wrapped up in all the research that they have found that they forget that they need to write a coherent narrative. A lot of lit reviews end up looking like a string of quotations, so the argument gets lost as, and so does the author's voice. As a rule of thumb, it's much more effective to paraphrase and then cite parenthetically to, so that you can demonstrate synthesis of multiple sources, but so that it's framed in a way to help build the point that we're making about the contemporary understanding of the literature. Fourth, Sometimes people get so wrapped up in their argument and making fact-based assertions that they forget to clearly support. Or sometimes on projects, students in particular have met a core requirement for a number of sources and forget that the point of having support is that any time that we're making a fact-based assertion, we need to cite research. Fifth, it, increasingly people find it difficult to separate fact from opinion. Findings from previous research can represent verifiable facts, assuming that the research is good. However, the conclusions that an author draws are their opinions about the facts. We can agree that the research is valid, but disagree with the implications. Sixth, it's important that the literature review itself be well structured and developed effectively throughout. And finally, a lit review, and more generally, any desk research, doesn't need to represent every piece of research within the field, but the objective is to produce a credible document that demonstrates the state of the field and approximately represents the literature base in it. So it's important that the more current research is reflected, as well as research demonstrate, demonstrating how the field has developed over time. If you can use these guidelines to direct the development of desk research, your projects will be more credible and frankly the piece of writing a lot more effective. So of course the opposite side to ineffective literature reviews are the qualities of effective literature reviews. To be clear, this list represents the best practices that we should all follow when collecting, organizing, and then writing up our desk research into the literature review. I've mentioned the purpose of the literature review is to provide a summary and analysis regarding the state of the field. But what sources should we be looking at when we do a literature review? Here we're talking about source quality and when doing academic or professional work, we want to use as high of quality sources as possible. This means when we're doing desk research and then putting it together for our lit reviews, the first place that we should be looking is to primary sources. These include peer-reviewed academic journals and scholarly texts. So why these over other sources? Well, the review process is incredibly rigorous for these. Initially, when an author submits their research to an academic journal, it's given a cursory review by the editor of the journal to determine if it's high enough quality to even be considered. And I can tell you there are a lot of pieces of research that are just rejected there and then. But if it makes it past the editor's review, it's sent out to two or three experts in the field. And, and it's not just generically experts in the field, but typically people whose own research is directly connected to the research being reviewed. And this is all blindly done. So the author doesn't know who's reviewing and the reviewers don't know who they are reviewing. So it takes the politics and favoritism out of the process as much as possible. So at that point, if the piece is judged to be worthwhile research, then it's published and typically after a round or two of editing and continued feedback. This principle applies with scholarly texts as well. So what this all means is that the piece that's actually published 
has been reviewed by experts in the field and to be judged as worthy. So this goes through this, this very rigorous process. This is why we can and generally should trust the information in academic journals because at the time they're published, they represent the cutting edge of knowledge and analysis. From there we move to secondary sources, which are still credible, but the review process isn't as rigorous. So we're talking about news broadcasts, magazines, newspapers, and even some edited news blogs. It's the editing process that helps to offer insight into whether the source can be trusted and differentiates these news sources from individual people's or organizations' blogs, which we should avoid citing in proper academic and professional research. It's in the editing process because there's a responsibility to verify the information. Now, we all know there are better and worse news and public interest publications, and often that's because of the political bias that can enter into the discussion. For example, in the UK, the BBC director in 2020 stated that one of the principal missions of the BBC was to support the union. And that helps to explain why the BBC's coverage of Scotland and the SNP can often be biased towards a union view. So even in credible news organizations, editorial decisions can affect the quality and the fairness of the information. But that said, good and well-respected publications and broadcasts can be used in lit reviews and desk research for current events information very effectively. And so they're a useful secondary source. How do we go about finding good sources? Of course, we should all be looking in and using the resources available to us in our university libraries. One of the values added by university libraries are the subscriptions to academic search engines and publishers that gives us high quality research and full text research without having to purchase anything. We should also avoid generic Google searches because that doesn't necessarily filter out non-credible sources. However, one way of connecting your university access with the power of the Google search engine is by using Google Scholar. It's a separate search engine that only looks for academic or peer-reviewed sources. So if you're signed into your university library system, then the articles and the books that you have access to within the university system can be searched for and downloaded through Google. When you find sources, even good sources, how do you know which ones to include? Well, there are three tests of source quality that we all consider. The first of these is recency, which asks, relative to the research topic, is a source that you have found recent enough to reflect the latest knowledge? Now, there isn't a hard and fast rule for this. For example, if I'm researching the War of 1812, a source that's 100 years old may meet the recency test if no new information has been revealed about the War of 1812. However, if I'm talking about computers and the internet, a source from five years ago may not be recent enough. However, in the field of communication, generally speaking, we'd like to see most of the sources in our lit reviews from the last five years. However, we also expect to see some foundational sources cited as well. So ones ranging from six to 50 years old, depending on the particular topic. But your rule of thumb should focus on more recent research because theory and research is advancing all the time. The second test for source is sufficiency. Sufficiency asks whether or not there is enough credible data reported in the piece of research to allow the researcher to draw the conclusions that he or she has. I like using ancient aliens as an example for this. What the format of the show and frankly the people who are ancient alien theorists do is a great example of insufficiency of evidence. Now, the show always starts with a little bit of an archaeological or historic information about something, like the pyramids, for example. So they get a proper academic to talk about their field of study. This sets up what seems to be a credible argument. Then the ancient alien theorists take over and start with wild conjecture that uses logic that would go something like this. Well, there are seven pyramids, so that connects to the Seven Sisters constellation, and that's telling us that they're calling to the aliens from that part of space who are the ones responsible for building the pyramids. Now, if you've seen the show, you know exactly what I mean. If you haven't seen the show, watch it. It's a wild ride. 
But this is the kind of wild jumping to conclusions that can happen in research and news sources, so it's important that you read the whole piece carefully to make sure there aren't any ancient alien theorist jumps in logic. Why? Well, we don't want to sound like crackpots. One of the reasons we do literature reviews is to build our own credibility as well as the credibility of the research itself, and we don't want to shoot that in the foot. The final and most important test for a source is the credibility of the researcher. For example, my area of expertise is broadly the field of communication, and more narrowly risk and crisis communication, and topics connected to that like business strategy, marketing, persuasion, social responsibility, that kind of thing. So if I start talking about political philosophy, you could ask whether I have the background to be talking about that or not, and that would absolutely be a very fair question to ask. As a side note, the answer is kind of yes, I'm not an expert, but I do love reading a bit of political philosophy and the history around it. But so that means that credibility can be evaluated in a number of ways. What I've just been talking about is the first way to judge credibility, author qualification. What about an author's background gives them the expertise to comment on or to research a particular subject? It answers the question, why should we believe this particular person? A second way to evaluate source credibility is author bias. Now, someone can be very well qualified to talk about a topic, but they may have a strong bias. If they're upfront about that bias, then it's better than if they try to pretend that they're neutral. In news sources, for example, this is very easy to talk about. For example, conservative politicians often like to talk about the liberal news media. However, when the stories are broadcast on different news sources are measured for political bias in the UK, this is how it comes out. It turns out, not surprisingly, that Sky News is the most biased towards the Conservatives, as is ITV News. The BBC is slightly more Labour biased compared to Conservative or Lib Dem, but still mostly neutral. However, Channel 4 comes out with the least politically biased coverage, at least in terms of particular political parties, with, interestingly, the most favorable coverage towards the Lib Dems, but still mostly no measurable bias. So it's not that we should or shouldn't watch or use any of these particular networks in our research, but we would have to do it with our eyes wide open. In research, understanding the particular biases of authors can help us to identify the potential gaps of knowledge and information and lay the groundwork for our own research. So identifying bias is important but it doesn't discount any piece from being used. It's just that those pieces have to be put in perspective. Third, we should also consider author background when evaluating sources, and maybe not just what we know about them at that particular moment. People end up in all kinds of professions and work environments, but certainly that doesn't tell their complete story. For example, Frankie Boyle, the comedian, used to be a school teacher. Interestingly, there are quite a few comedians that used to be teachers. Now, if he puts out this book, Critiquing Modern Consumption and Work Lives, we may want to ask what it is in his background that makes him qualified to talk about that. And it's worth asking that question. So basically, we need to re reserve judgment about people, their arguments, and their attitudes until we better understand their background. It's an important part of evaluating source quality because we need to look deeper than what might be the top factoid known about that person. Finally, sometimes we may not be able to find a lot of information about the person, especially in research settings. There just may not be a lot of information known because the person isn't a public figure. So how then do we evaluate the source quality? Well, instead of looking at the person or people who have done the research, we come back to the source itself. Where has the information been published? So we've already been talking about academic journals being the best sources because they're peer reviewed with blind review. We've also talked about edited sources being typically acceptable because the information also has to be reviewed. This means that typically we want to avoid open source like blogs, YouTube, and the like when we're doing literature reviews because if the person isn't themselves credible, then the open source doesn't help establish the credibility of the author. For example, my dog has a YouTube channel, but why would you trust recommendations for products or services on what's functionally an anonymous channel? You shouldn't. So the litmus test for source quality in desk research and literature reviews needs to be higher, either because we're using people or sources that are high quality.
This is also useful to keep in mind when we're encountering information in our regular lives. Ask who or what the source of the information is for people's arguments. There's a lot of rubbish that falls away when we do that. I've been using the word argument a lot in this lecture, so let's also be precise about what I mean when I'm talking about arguments and argumentation. We're not talking about some verbal altercation that may involve some level of insult or aggression. We are talking about a systematic way for presenting information that's designed to be persuasive, credible, and clear. The best structure for an argument was developed a couple thousand years ago by the Greeks, specifically Plato and Aristotle, and since then we simply haven't found a structure for arguments that are better. This is a structure that I'd really recommend everyone work on developing in all of your professional writing, from emails and memos to full-on reports and papers. I talk about this in terms of how we put a single argument together within a paragraph, and the five steps that we need to follow in order to have an effective paragraph. But the five components of a good argument should be clear and present in every single main point that we write, as well as our overall papers. I promise you this, if you use this structure and this approach to your writing, it will improve your writing substantially. So let's take a look at the five steps to writing a single good paragraph. First, there must always be a claim. This is a concise sentence identifying the point. Claims can be either informative or persuasive. So if we're talking about something that's very common in PR, the relationship between organizations and their stakeholders, an example of an informative claim would be something like, there are three factors that influence the relationship between organizations and their stakeholders. Similarly, an example of a persuasive claim would be, there's a lack of cross-cultural research in stakeholder reactions to crises. Notice the purpose in these two claims are very different. The first one is about providing necessary background on a topic, but it's still argumentative because it's making an assertion that there are specifically three factors that influence the relationship, whereas the persuasive claim is just making a straightforward assertion about the intercultural information in crisis contexts. The important component to this is that these are single declarative sentences that make it clear what's going to be discussed. Additionally, the placement of the claim is vital. These should be the first or second sentence in a paragraph. It can be the second sentence when you need a transition or some kind of attention getter. What happens though is a lot of people wander through their argument without explicitly stating their claim up front, and this can confuse the reader. That's never a good thing. Put your claim up front and then develop the rest of the argument. In our first step, the claim, we're laying out the point that we're making. However, that may include technical information or concepts that your reader may not be familiar with. So remember, one of the critical parts to writing good lit reviews that we've already talked about was not making the assumptions that the reader was overly familiar with the topic. This means that the second component is the explanation of the claim. When we explain the claim, we're offering brief, as in one or two concise sentences, critical definitions and background on the claim to make it clear what we're talking about. The purpose, of course, is to help the reader understand the claim. Explanation can be connected to our evidence or can just be a standalone sentence or two. So if we come back to the persuasive claim from the last slide, that there is a lack of cross-cultural research in stakeholder reactions to crises, then the explanation for that claim might look like this. Most research related to crisis communication and crisis management comes from an American perspective, is based in American case studies, or specifically analyses of American attitudes. So what this statement is doing is offering a bit of perspective, but it's also offering a bit of evidence to support that claim as well. Once we establish steps one and two, the claim and a bit more background or clarity on it, then we need to prove the point. We need to introduce evidence that demonstrates our claim is correct. The support can range from testimony to narratives to hard statistics. Research on evidence shows that the most persuasive documents or arguments will use a variety of types of evidence across the document because frankly, different people are persuaded by different types of support. As a result, it's useful to vary the type of support offered as you go from paragraph to paragraph and argument to argument. However, within a single argument or paragraph, typically we'll only have one type of support because being concise is also important. <laughs> 
So if we come back to our example claim about crisis research needing more diversity of viewpoints, I explained that saying that it was American-centric. Now here's the evidence for that point. For example, between 1953 and 2015, there were 690 journal articles written about crisis communication, and 417 of those focus on the US, 126 focus on Europe, 71 on Asia, 21 on Australasia, and the Middle East as well as Central and South America each have six, and Africa only has eight. Notice that from the claim to the explanation to support, there isn't repetition, but everything is aligned and the argument builds in its complexity and its information. We start simple and then we build the point. However, leaving the paragraph ending at the support doesn't tie all the pieces together well. Even though I've written a well-aligned piece to this point, if I end the argument there, it leaves the reader to draw his or her own conclusions and we don't want to do that. Ambiguity in argumentation can mean that people draw their own ancient alien theorist conclusions, and that's never a good thing. So we want to put the evidence that we offer in context and connect the pieces together. So the fourth step in writing a good argument is to offer explanation of the support itself. Explanation of the support connects the support to the claim, helps the reader to interpret the support, and works to show the validity of the claim. So with our example claim about the need to improve cross-cultural knowledge and crisis communication because it's American-centric, and with about two-thirds of the articles published over the last 60 years focusing on the U.S., I would explain that this way. Even though the articles focusing on the U.S. sometimes included cross-cultural comparisons, the findings from my analysis demonstrate that when the U.S. was one of the countries analyzed, it was highly unlikely that any other country would be included in the data set. The reason I include this information was to preempt the question that someone might have. Well, just because the research includes an American perspective, can't it also include other ones? The data says largely no. So the explanation of the support can be used to provide additional clarity. Again, we're not repeating anything. We're providing depth and context to it. And finally, we have to tie everything together. Offering a one-sentence conclusion is not only making the writing more elegant, but also helping improve the reader's ability to remember the point. When we write, we're taking a reader on a journey from a simple claim through a potentially complex set of information. So the function of the conclusion is to wrap up the point, summarize what's been written without simply repeating the claim. This also functions to help make a smooth transition between paragraphs and arguments that we're making. I like to think of writing as both science and art. There is technique and a proper mix of components to include, but it has to read well to be effective. So if we're wrapping up the argument about crisis communication research being too American-centric, then I might say something like this. Therefore, one of the fundamental weaknesses in the field of crisis management and crisis communication is its American-centric focus, and future research should focus on broadening our understanding of different regions as well as a cross set of cross-cultural comparisons. When we put it all together, this is what the paragraph looks like. I want to point out a number of components that come back to the points that I've been making about effective literature reviews. First, you'll notice that academic and professional writing is about communicating a lot of information in a relatively short space. Now, in a professional piece as compared to an academic one, I might use some bullet points to separate out some of the points of support. However, I'm still going to cover that information. But an effective argument isn't a short, choppy paragraph. It has some chunkiness weight to it. But if you were to copy and paste this into a regular document, it's still only about a third of a page. If you find yourself writing a full page or page plus paragraphs, odds are that you have multiple arguments being presented altogether. A paragraph should have a single argument that's fully developed. Second, you'll also see six source citations from four different sources within the same paragraph. 
when I was talking about the synthesis of information without losing the author's, or in my case, voice, this is what I mean. I'm citing a lot of sources within a single paragraph without using a single direct quotation, but it is plainly evident where I'm borrowing the information from. This is what I mean when I'm talking about good literature reviews being focused in comprehensive syntheses and analyses of present research without losing the author's voice and not sounding like a book report. Third, you can see the different ways that research has been introduced by introducing the author in text or just parenthetically citing it. Notice that we only use the last names and we don't talk about journal article or newspaper sources that are used. That's what we have reference sections for. Every source in this paragraph or throughout the paper is listed in the reference section with the full information about them. Finally, you'll also notice that when we cite authors, we use the author order in the papers themselves. We do not rearrange author order. For example, the Schroeder and Pennington Gray source at the very end Schroeder is the first author, that's why he or she is listed first. Pennington Gray is listed second. So overall, when I'm talking about arguments in an academic context, this is what I'm talking about. So how do you get started with your research? There isn't one right way to do it. I tend to like sitting down and doing a really general search if it's a topic that's pretty new to me. Then I read a few articles and get a better sense of the keywords and directions that I want to go. But it can be really useful to think about different brainstorming techniques like problem clouds that focus on generating different ideas and how different ideas might relate to one another. It genuinely doesn't matter how you go about doing your research, but it does matter that you find an approach that works for you. However, I would really encourage you to do your research before you begin writing. What I've seen from student papers all too often is that students will start writing towards the end of the semester and then try and fill in research that fits and that just doesn't work because to be blunt, until we're experts in the field, we don't know enough about our topics to do that. Begin by doing the reading, then think about how the concepts and ideas connect, then start writing. You'll end up with fewer rewrites and a lot more efficient productive process. In the end, you end up working smarter, not harder. As we pull all of this back together, when we're talking about desk research and writing literature reviews, we're talking about an inductive knowledge process. We're trying to identify knowledge gaps and then build our information and our insight to produce new information and new insights. But none of this can start without developing a deep knowledge about the topics that we're researching. And the best way to do that is to start with the work that's come before us.